Our second reading is from the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. It is the um, traditional reading for the first Sunday of Lent, which this is, given that Ash Wednesday was Wednesday. And it was a delight to have a three-way worship service here with Emmanuel UCC and North Ontario United Methodist Church. Um, so now we begin fully our Lenten journey. Listen again for God's word to you. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, since you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, one does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will be all yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, Since you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We know that sometimes it takes questions to push us beyond our habits, like our children or grandchildren asking, why aren't you recycling that? Why, I asked myself a few years ago, did I so resist changing from incandescent light bulbs to carbon fluorescence? I know that they're more environmentally sound, but I didn't like the inconvenience of waiting for them to warm up. Or why do I knowingly let the tap water run unnecessarily? There's a wonderful ad running on uh, Facebook and other social media sites about all the things that can happen during the time one leaves the water running while brushing your teeth. Why, we might ask ourselves, do we continue to buy items that we dearly love but we know are made at the expense of someone's dignity? Or why do we continue to live in ways that impoverish parts of creation, even when we know the harm it does? Well, a few years ago, I began to mull over these questions, and I had to admit that the candid answer was, because I can. It's so easy. The options are available. The expense is negligible. They may be cheaper. It pleases me. There are a variety of answers, but because I can is often at the bottom. Because I can is the answer of privilege, which is how we tend to live compared to much of the world. Because I can assumes that if we're able to do something, then we should avail ourselves of it and do it. After all, we've worked hard, we, uh, have, we deserve some comfort. What's wrong with that? Shouldn't we use our influence to make our lives and our community better? If we've risen above the crowd and we're in a position of power, why not use it for ourselves? 
Because I can is the way the world typically works. At the top of the socioeconomic ladder are the elite, the wealthy folks who have power, either because of their money or the influence that comes with it or the influence of position. The elite are the movers and shakers, the celebrities, those in the news for their acts of power and their name recognition. Now, they can't be elite all on their own. They need people to make their power possible. And these are the clients of the elite, those who have close proximity and make their services available to those in power. So as a result, the clients benefit too, and they become dependent on the goodwill of those on top. At the bottom is the service industry, those who produce the goods and services that clients and elite need. Think upper management, middle management, labor. For the most part, our society has said, why not? It seems to make sense. It seems to be just the way it is, as Lynn Twist said. Why shouldn't people use power and money to maintain and fulfill status? Well, this is what's at stake when Satan or the devil or evil tests Jesus in the wilderness. It's because I can. That's what Satan assumes that people in power do. Satan assumes that Jesus will use his status for his own gain. Satan knows that Jesus is the Son of God. If you'll notice, I read uh, since you are the Son of God, in the translation, if you were reading along, said if. Think since is a better translation of the Greek. Satan knows that Jesus is the Son of God. The question is, what does it mean? What do you do with that power? And Satan assumes that power means you're going to use it to benefit you. That's what it's for. Now, we look at this passage and we often think of, uh, the, that it's about the temptation of Jesus. The Greek word uh, parazo means both testing and tempting. What Satan is really doing here is testing Jesus as the Son of God. The issue isn't to find out who Jesus is, but to find out what it means to be the Son of God. How will that status be used? What is it for? Satan calls on Jesus to use his status for his own comfort and privilege. So first comes a subtle test. Calling on Jesus to fill the hunger pangs and turn stones into bread. The desert is full of stones. One or two would not be missed. Is there any imaginable reason why Jesus should not use his status and power to take care of his needs? He was famished after 40 days. It sounds very reasonable, and it's what people with power do, right? No, says Jesus. A person's life is not about fulfilling their own needs. We do not live by bread alone. We do not live by creature comforts alone. In the second test, Satan positions himself as the ultimate elite power person, the one who can make things happen for those who serve him as clients. In effect, Satan says, all right, well, if you're not going to claim your status for yourself, then why not claim my high position and you can still benefit? Acknowledge my elite status, be my client, and I'll be your benefactor and I'll give you everything. That's how the world works, isn't it? Get in good with me and you will benefit. No says Jesus. I'm already somebody else's client. I already work for God. God wants our worship and our unbounded allegiance and our services only to the Lord. 
We don't choose whom we will serve in order to get personal gain. The third test is again about benefactors. This time it's God as the ultimate elite who, Satan says, obviously has to protect the Son of God. How could God possibly stand by and let a beloved chosen one fall and be harmed? That's not how those in power treat their clients and representatives. God would have to save you. Being tight with the power person means privileges. No, it doesn't, says Jesus. That's not what my high status is for. Status and power are not ends in themselves. They're not things to be gained for their own sake or for personal use. Status is to be used in the service of God. Power is to be used to further God's designs. It's God's agenda that gives us our marching orders. Your map of the, sa of the world, Satan, is all wrong. It is not the labor sector in the service of the middle and upper. It's not the poor serving the rich. God has a different map, and God has my allegiance. Throughout the ministry of Jesus, we see that different map at work. We come to learn that God is at the top in the position of power as the one of ultimate elite status, but God works through chosen agents and representatives for important tasks. And that important task is bringing divine compassion to people in need. God brings divine care through chosen agents, bringing that down. So the focus of God's work is people in need. And in Luke's gospel, we see the big agent, Jesus, at work for people's needs. We also see many agents being called and sent out for that same work. And by extension, we hear ourselves being called as chosen agents to do this important work of God. When we follow this kind of map, it's those at the top who serve those on the lowest rung. Power is used to meet human need. The whole point of having status is not to benefit your friends and bring riches to your home community because you can. The point of status is to alleviate suffering where people are most in need because you can, by God. Now that can be a very hard message for us to hear. And it was very hard for those around Jesus to grasp. The hometown folks in Nazareth became enraged when it becomes clear that Jesus' focus is not on bringing them special favors as the native son, but instead it's on using his position to help others in even greater need. Jesus' priority is for those in great need of God's compassion. And why? Because he can. It's his call. He can. And that's what it means to be the Son of God. That's what it means for all, all of us who are chosen agents working for God. Someone whose life beautifully illustrates this message is William Wilberforce, a morally straight, uncompromisingly focused politician in the late 18th century in Britain. He worked tirelessly to stop the British slave trade. He saw clearly that God's desire was for people in need. So he was elected to the House of Commons at age 21, and he tried to pass a number of bills over and over and over, and they all failed. But he pressed on in hopes of persuading the British government to support abolition. He and his fellow abolitionists scoured England, 
collecting evidence of the slave trade's crimes. As part of that effort, he collected nearly 400,000 signatures from British citizens in support of the anti-slavery cause. Finally, after 20 years of struggle, Wilberforce saw the end of the British slave trade in 1807, when his abolition bill, finally a bill, passed by a large majority. 26 years later, just before his death, slavery was abolished all across British colonies. Despite chronic illness and the repeated death of his anti, the repeated defeat of his anti-slavery bills in Parliament, Wilberforce persisted in his mission to abolish injustice. And he went on. He lent his assistance to hospitals and prisons, and he founded what we know today as the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. For his abiding courage and conviction, Wilberforce earned the title Conscience of Parliament. But he didn't develop that conscience on his own. It happened that his pastor, when he was a child, was none other than John Newton, who authored the lyrics for Amazing Grace. Some of you will know the story of that hymn's writing. John Newton was a sailor who ran ships for the British slave trade. On one trip, he had a near-death experience in Sierra Leone, and it changed his life forever. He turned away from the slave trade, and he headed for ministry. He said, only God's amazing grace could take a rude, profane, slave-trading sailor and transform him into a child of God. He went from being one of the clients of the powerful elite who wanted slaves to being a chosen agent for God as a minister of the church. And it was in that capacity that he could advise the young William Wilberforce when he became discouraged with politics and wondered if he too should become a minister. Newton advised Wilberforce that he had been placed in his role as a member of parliament to abolish the slave trade. And that was in the House of Commons. That was where Newton said Wilberforce could best serve God. So Wilberforce took Newton's advice. And throughout his political career, Newton encouraged him to stay the course and see the cause through to the end. Jesus used his status as son of God to bring divine compassion to people in need. William Wilberforce used his power to change the lives of the enslaved. Jesus now calls us to be his chosen agents to continue that mission, to bring good news to the impoverished, and to steward the earth's resources for God's best interests. It means thinking differently about power, about position, and about status, because we're called and we can.